Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 60th annual Deborah Morton Convocation Ceremony. My name is Dan McCormick, and I'm the chair of the University of New England's Board of Trustees. On behalf of the entire board, I would like to welcome the three women we will be honoring today, their friends and family members, our former Deborah Morton Society winners, recipients, the Westbrook College alumni who are in attendance, the UNE students joining us, as well as our UNE faculty and professional staff, senior leaders, trustees, and President Herbert. Thank you all for gathering to help us induct our 2022 Deborah Morton Society awardees. Three women who will today join the ranks of generations of important Maine women leaders previously inducted into this exclusive society. This year's honorees are Lise Peltier, Hannah Pingree, and Julia Sleeper Whiting. All three of these women, in the spirit of Deborah Morton, have made lasting impacts on the state of Maine and its people. All three have achieved high distinction in their fields and have dedicated their time to civic leadership, education, and advocacy. All three have inspired countless others to be the best they can be. And we're grateful for their contribu contributions to our wonderful state. You will hear much more about these amazing women shortly, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce the University of New England Provost, Dr. Karen Pardue. Karen previously served as Dean and Associate Dean of the Westbrook College of Health Professions, and she's been serving as our Provost and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs while UNE conducts a search for a permanent Provost. So please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Karen to the podium. So. Thank you, Dan, for that warm introduction. And thank you for your leadership and service to our Board of Trustees. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to participate in this campus's time-honored tradition of celebrating exceptional accomplishments and character of Maine women through this annual Deborah Morton Award. This event is truly one of the highlights each calendar year here at the University of New England. Gathering like this to celebrate our newest Deborah Morton Society members allows us to reflect on the remarkable accomplishments of our state's women leaders through the years. Accordingly, I'd like to say a few words to focus our attention on the former Westbrook student and then faculty member for whom this ward is named. She was an unparalleled woman leader, and her legacy resonates across this campus and throughout the state of Maine, even to this day. I'm talking, of course, about Deborah Morton. At a time when social expectations for women were very different than they are today, Ms. Morton was a scholar, a leader, a reformer, a teacher, a mentor, and an adventurer. She traveled the world and she brought knowledge and experiences back to share with others, including her curious and appreciative students at Westbrook College. At a young age, Deborah entered Westbrook Seminary in the fall of 1876, and she graduated as valedictorian her class in 1889. She spent the next few years teaching in her hometown of Round Pond, Maine, before returning to Westbrook as a member of the faculty in 1884. She taught grammar, rhetoric, English, algebra, demonstrating an erudite and sophisticated command of many, many subjects, just as UNE students do today, who receive a bachelor's in liberal arts coupled with the expertise of their chosen major. The very next year, 1885, Ms. Morton was named Westbrook College's preceptress. For the next three decades, she spent the school year shaping young women's lives and then spent her summers overseas exploring Europe and the Middle East while refining her foreign language skills 
much in the same way that young women at UNE do today as they have study abroad opportunities through our global education program. In 1917, with a pandemic and world war looming, Ms. Morton took a leave of absence from teaching to more fully engage herself in civic life, where she served as president of the Women's Literary Union and a very active member of the YWCA War Council. Eventually, she returned to Westbrook College to resume teaching French in, 18, in 1940. After this long and storied career, the Deborah Morton Award was established to recognize Maine women leaders who have distinguished themselves through their work in their careers, public service, work in civic, cultural, or social causes. The award was created and first presented at the occasion of the 130th anniversary of Westbrook College at a public convocation on April 20th, 1961. The title of the convocation, The Modern World and Education of Women. Dorothy Healy, a former Westbrook College administrator and co-founder, first curator of the Maine Women Writers Collection, was instrumental in establishing this award. And at that time, the first award celebrated 12 Maine women at this inaugural event. Ms. Healy, whose own association with Westbrook College spanned 50 years, reminisced, and I quote, I had thought myself educated until I met Ms. Morton. She taught me two lessons of immense value. The first is education is a never-ending quest. Indeed, life is of little or no value when the one's will to learn has stopped. And second, Ms. Morton taught that every idea worth holding is also worth doubting, testing, and evaluating, end quote. The lessons of Deborah Morton provide keen insight and they seem so very relevant to our lives today. In our currently dynamic, polarized world, we must keep learning. We must continue to challenge our assumptions and we must yearn for opportunities to grow. Through the decades, Westbrook College's Deborah Morton Award continues to be presented each spring to women of exceptional character and accomplishments in lieu of an honorary uh, degree. Then, after Westbrook College merged in 1996 with an ambitious university in Biddeford to create the modern University of New England, this annual convocation transitioned into a standalone event. The pomp and circumstance of this processional reflect the honor and the dignity embodied by the original award. And in so doing, the legacy established by Ms. Morton continues to boldly live on. The University of New England is incredibly proud to have inspired leaders like Deborah Morton as part of our own institutional legacy. Indeed, Ms. Morton's pioneering spirit is wired into the DNA of today's UNE. And we continue each year with the tradition of celebrating Maine's women leaders in her honor. At this time, I am pleased to welcome to the podium Gilda Nardone, a Westbrook College graduate herself and chair of the Deborah Morton Society. Oh. I'm gonna find where you need to be, Gilda. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Provost Pardu. And, and um, welcome to everyone who's here to celebrate these extraordinary women. Indeed, Deborah Morton was an inspiration to her classmates, students, colleagues, and the women of Maine. And it's a great privilege for my fellow steering committee members and me to play the role we do in facil facilitating each year's ceremony. As we narrow down each year's list of prospective awardees, we're just amazed by the wealth of women leaders spread across our state, all doing incredible things to improve the lives of their fellow citizens and their communities. 
I have to think Deborah Morton would be quite proud of the move movement she helped to create. And I'm proud of the fact that we continue to help the young women of today fulfill their educational and professional dreams through the Deborah Morton Endowed Scholarship at UNE. Since its establishment in 1974, this fund has provided more than 80 Maine women with critical financial aid and other support so they can pursue degrees in the healthcare fields at UNE. The scholarship is awarded annually to two freshman women who come to UNE from Maine high schools. Unlike most scholarships, which, which are just for one year, this scholarship follows them throughout their four years at the university. They, major, they may major in any of UNE's healthcare fields, pursuing degrees in subjects like applied exercise science, athletic training, dental hygiene, health, wellness, and occupational studies, nursing, nutrition, pre-pharmacy, social work, and public health. These are essential fields in, to the health of Maine and its people, and the women who gain mastery of them during their time on this campus emerge ready to do their part. I think we've certainly seen that during this pandemic. I'm grateful that we can play the role we do in helping them along their way. When we invest in the up and coming generation of women leaders, we all benefit in the present and throughout their long careers. It is now my pleasure to turn things over to the president of the University of New England, James D. Herbert, who has proven to be a great supporter of and advocate for the society since his arrival at UNE in 2017. Please join me in welcoming President Herbert. Thank you, Gilda. Thank you very much. And thank you, Karen and Dan, as well, for your, your wonderful comments. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see everyone. And it is so nice to be back in person, all together, uh, for this wonderful ceremony. This is, um, owing to the pandemic and all of the, the disruptions that it calls, this is the first time that we've been able to gather together to honor the Deborah Morton Society awardees during the Westbrook reunion weekend since the June of 2019. We did gather last fall for our 2021 induction ceremony, but, but this is really where it belongs at this time of year, in the spring when our campus is you know, budding and, and full of life again. So I'm really pleased that we're all able to be back together and to get the, the, the ceremony back on course when it belongs. It's nice to know that even during a once in a century pandemic, that couldn't derail the moment, momentum of the Deborah Morton Society and all of the, everything that it set in motion so long ago. I suspect that nothing could, in fact. This marks the 60th year that the stewards of this campus and this society have gathered together to remember Ms. Morton and to ce celebrate the state's contemporary women heroes. And I suspect 60 years from now, people will still be gathering, hopefully at this time in June, to both remember this society's namesake and to look admiringly upon the latest women leaders cut from her mold. As Gilda mentioned, we're truly fortunate to have so many accomplished women leaders here in Maine. And the work of pouring through their credentials to call the very best of the best is no small job. And as such, I'd like to begin by thanking the members of the Deborah Morton Society Steering Committee for their work. These individuals spend countless hours each year reviewing the accomplishments of and ultimately nominating awardees who fulfill the exacting standards set by the society's guidelines. At this time, I'd like to recognize them. They're Ellie Baker, Brenda Guerin, Susan Carlisle, Gilda Nardone, Peggy Rotundo, Pat Ryan, and Barbara Trafton. Friends, please stand so we may acknowledge you. Thank you so much for your service um, to the society and, and all of the support that you bring to the society and to you any more broadly. Over the past six decades, the Deborah Morton Awards have been presented to more than 200 women. Many of our past recipients are present here today to welcome this year's new inductees. At this time, I invite all members of the Deborah Morton Society to please rise and be recognized.
Thank you so much for, for coming out and, and being here to join us today. And at this time, I'd also like to take a moment to remember three members of the Deborah Morton Society who've passed away since our last gathering. Sadly, Alice Savage, Lynn Goldfarb, and Donna Cheney are no longer with us. Please join me in observing a moment of silence to reflect upon their lives and acknowledge their absence. Thank you. So it's been almost five years now, in fact, just two weeks, not even two weeks, 10 days short of five years now since I joined the University of New England back in 2017. And it's been an amazing journey um, spent getting to know this incredible institution and its people and putting in place and implementing several of the plans to secure UNE's prosperous future for many, many decades to come. My tenure thus far has certainly been a whirlwind, especially considering the challenges posed by the pandemic, which we resolutely decided would not deter us from our progress on so many important fronts. But I do occasionally find time for quiet contemplation. I find time to reflect on the awesome responsibility entrusted to me and to my senior leadership team as we guide Maine's largest private university along its path. There's so many aspects of our university that make me proud. From our role as the number one provider of healthcare professionals for the state of Maine, to our role in assessing and mitigating the effects of climate change in the Gulf of Maine, to our role in providing the Maine economy with a steady stream of graduates especially prepared to meet the needs of today's dynamic and changing workforce. There's so much to be proud of. But in these quiet moments, there's one aspect of UNE that fills me with a special sort of pride, and that's our commitment to expanding access to higher education for students from traditionally underserved groups from across the state. As a first-generation college student myself, this commitment really hits home. Our message to students is that we are an inclusive and supportive community, and if they are hungry to learn and to grow, there is a place for them on our campus. Each fall, we welcome many first-generation students to campus. As well, we welcome young people that reflect our increasingly diverse society and state. This commitment to inclusivity has deep historical roots. In Portland, these roots trace back all the way to 1831 when the Westbrook Seminary opened its doors and began admitting women to the campus where we gather right here this morning. Later, Westbrook College took up the mantle of educating and empowering women on these very grounds. During times when American society tried to define women and limit what they could do and who they could be, the women who filled the halls of this campus refused to follow the expected script. They studied hard and they flourished, just as the young women and the young men on UNE's Portland campus do today. I hope the Westbrook College and Westbrook Junior College alumni in attendance will feel some sort of connection to today's UNE students. If you're a Westbrook alumna, please stand so that we may recognize you. Thank you so much. As women who have led successful careers in various fields, you have paved the way for so many of the successes that our current students enjoy, and we're lucky to have you as part of the larger UNE family. The Deborah Morton Society is one important way we pay tribute to our proud to tradition of women leadership. Another is through the curation of the UNE Maine Women, Women's Writers Collection, which preserves the writing of Maine women. It includes material from acclaimed authors, as well as women who wrote only in diaries, letters, and other unpublished materials, shedding light on such topics as the suffrage movement, women's education, women's health and sexuality, family culture, and Maine and New England history. It is located right here on this campus in the library. If you haven't yet had an opportunity to visit it, I strongly encourage you to do so. And I hope you'll, you'll take some time to explore the many other treasures on our campus. While the historic look and feel of the Westbrook campus landscape remain today, UNE's Portland campus also provides students with access to the latest technology and equipment related to their fields. Indeed, it is an important link connecting Westbrook Seminary to Westbrook College 
to the modern UNE. The university's many women leaders on faculty and in the administration form another link in our identity, and the Deborah Morton Society forms yet another. At this time, I'd like to turn our attention to the three remarkable women we've gathered to honor today. I've asked members of the Board of Trustees to assist in sharing their names, and our first trustee to do so is Fran Girard. Good morning. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the University of New England, it's my pleasure to present 2022 Deborah Morton Society Award recipient, Lise Pelletier. So I believe you stand right here. Okay. Right here. Lise Pelletier is the former director of the Acadian Archives at the University of Maine, Fort Kent, and president of the Maine Acadian Heritage Council. Born in Fort Kent, just across the bridge from Clare, New Brunswick, Lise grew up on both sides of the St. Johns River. From an early age, she was shaped by the Franco-American traditions and values that defined this region. Later, as a single parent of three young children, she completed college as a non-traditional student, garnering academic awards and scholarships in both undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Upon graduating, she stayed in academia, teaching French literature and language at her alma mater, l'Université de Moncton, Campus d'Egmonston, and at the University of Maine, Fort Kent. She also became a high school French teacher in Fort Kent, where she observed that an appreciation for Acadian culture was eroding. And so she made it her mission to bring the history and culture of the Acadians um, to St. John Valley residents and outside the world in her role as director of the Acadian Archives at the University of Maine, Fort Kent. Towards this end, Lise has given more than 100 lectures in Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Quebec, Washington, Georgia, and France about the Acadians of the St. John Valley. She also created an Acadian treasure trunk, a, a lending kit of educational materials to help teachers bring the stories of the Acadians and Franco-Americans into the classroom. As president of the Maine Acadian Heritage Council, Lee's even, even brought the World Acadian Congress to the St. John Valley in 2014. Her work has been recognized with the Caring Canadian Award, the Maine Acadian Heritage Council's President's Award, and she's been inducted into the Maine Franco-American Hall of Fame. So please join me in welcoming and honoring Lise Petier. Merci. Thank you. Bonjour. President Herbert, mon nouvel ami. Members of the Deborah Morton Society Steering Committee, University of New England Board of Trustees, Society awardees, and distinguished guests. I would like to thank some special people without whom I would not be here and would not be who I am. My parents embraced life with a fervor born of strife and an unshakable integrity. My grandmother, who exemplified unconditional love and whose death caused me to question everything I believed. My children, who gave me the courage to make the biggest leap of faith. One of my first professors at the undergraduate level, Wendy, who is here in the audience, constantly challenged me to do and be more. And she wouldn't say, here, Lise, do this. No, she'd hand me an article and, and say, oh, I thought of you when I read this. Or, have you read the latest report on women's health and women's world? She just knew I would grab that and take off. Along with Wendy, my best friends, Georgette and Jenny, Georgette is here as well, strong and vibrant women, and my husband, D David, whose support I can always count on and whose love 
gives me wings. My last 15 years of work allowed me to delve into the history and culture of the Acadians of the St. John Valley, where I was born. Acadians of the St. John Valley are the descendants of French who immigrated to the New World starting as early as 1604 to found a permanent colony. From St. Croix Island, they migrated to Port Royal, Nova Scotia. Our St. John Valley's ancestors were the survivors of an ethnic cleansing that occurred in Acadia, that is Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, over a period of eight years. Between 1755 and 1763, Acadians were forcibly removed from their homes and shipped off to Southern American British colonies or to prisons in England. Half the population of 18,000 Acadians died. While they were boarding the ships, their houses, outbuildings, churches were burned livestock were either confiscated or slaughtered. Families were torn apart as members embarked on different ships, each ship bearing a different destination. This tragedy is at the epicenter of the collective consciousness of the Acadian people. And yet, the Acadians I see every day are probably the happiest of people. They are famous for nurturing a strong sense of family and community, for their work ethic, for their resilience, and above all, their faith, their trust in life. Acadians and Franco-Americans, who represent approximately 40% of our population, have for centuries contributed to every aspect of life in Maine. We can learn so much from the history and cultures that shape the state. Here are a few vignettes of the St. John Valley. Marianne Gilbo was an eight-year-old prisoner on the Pembroke in December of 1755, along with 260 other Acadians. The ship was headed to North Carolina the Acadian men and women overtook the crew and steered the ship to the mouth of the St. John River. The former prisoners made their way on foot to safety in Quebec. The former prisoners um, also suffered from cholera and many of them died. As a young woman, Mary Ann Gilbo returned to the lower St. John River and married a son of Jean-Baptiste Cyr. He and his eight brothers settled in the St. John Valley with their parents and families in 1785. Marguerite Blanche Thibodeau, commonly called Tante Blanche or Aunt Blanche, in 1797, during a very harsh winter, when the food was scarce and the men had gone hunting, kept starvation at bay by going from house to house and distributing clothing, meals, and medicine collected at other houses. Antonin Maillet has been writing about Acadian history and folklore for over 60 years. In her 1979 novel, written in Acadian French, Pélagie, the Return to Acadia, she won the prestigious French literary prize, Le Goncourt, an acknowledgement of the existence of Acadians and the validity of their language. She invented a scrub woman who dispenses wisdom out of her bucket of dirty water, a character who was famous throughout the world. Marcella Violette was the first woman in the St. John Valley to earn a PhD in French. She was instrumental in keeping open the University of Maine at Fort Kent. She was a mother, an educator, a civic-minded citizen, and a generous soul. Yes, the personal is political. Yes, women's lives matter. My heartfelt thanks to the Barbara Morton Society Committee 
for recognizing the achievements of women in the state of Maine. It is an honor for me to be part of such a wonderful entourage. There is still so much work to be done. This award gives me the energy to continue. Merci. Merci beaucoup et félicitations, madame. Like she said, mon nouvel ami. Um, so I now call upon UNE trustee Brenda Guerin to present the next Deborah Morton Award candidate. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the University of New England, it's my pleasure to present the 2022 Deborah Morton Society Award recipient, Hannah Pingree. Hannah. <laughs> Hannah Pingree is director of the Maine Governor's Office Policy of Innovation and the Future. She was appointed to this position in January 2019 by another Deborah Morton Society awardee, our friend and the governor, Janet Mills. Previously, Hannah had served in the Maine legislature from 2002 to 2010. Her service in Augusta culminated with her election as Speaker of the Maine House of Representatives in 2008. Before that, she had served as Maine House Majority Leader, Chair of the Committee on Health and Human Services, and as a member of the Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. During her time in Augusta, Hannah's many contributions included spearheading successful legislation on energy, broadband access, housing, environmental health, and health care, all issues vital to the well-being of Mainers. Additionally, Hannah's career has included stents working in New York City for a technology startup company, managing several small family businesses right here in Maine, and leading the development of rural housing, energy efficiency, and elder care projects for a coalition, coalition of community nonprofits. At the local level, Hannah has chaired her local school board and has served on numerous state and community nonprofit boards. And I was privileged to work with Hannah on Governor Mills' Economic Recovery Committee last year, year before last year? I lost track. I lost track. <laughs> COVID, COVID does that to your brain, right? I can't tell when it was, but it was such a pleasure working with her and getting to know her during that time, a personal joy for me. Hannah has done so much for Maine's people and communities, and we're honored to welcome her into the Deborah Morton Society today. Hannah? Thank you. Thank you. President Herbert, uh, fellow honorees, members of the Board of Trustees, members of the Deborah Morton Society, uh, Barbara Trafton, my nominator, um, thank you so much for having me here today. We are living in very difficult times, as last night reminded us, as the events of every subsequent week and month seem to remind us over and over in daunting and overwhelming ways. Political challenges, pandemics, extremism, war, poverty, unrest, violence, the climate and weather, so many challenges confront our country and give us a sense that the future is uncertain. So many of us are struggling with the growing weight of that uncertainty, and I get it and I feel that challenge. But despite that weight, I am here to tell you that I feel very, very lucky to have the opportunity to make a meaningful difference each day, especially in the state of Maine, that I love and a state that I believe has a very bright future. My optimism and perspective has been shaped by my community, my family, and my sense of this place, which has shown me over and over again that the way to confront challenges and the way things improve is by really digging in and not giving up. I've seen my neighbors, my community, and people across Maine do good and great things in the same way, by engaging in the problem, by bringing people together, and by finding solutions. And these good things happen because we know that nobody else is coming to save us. We know that change comes from each one of us. Change comes when we engage with our communities and with each other, whatever that community might be for each one of us. Even when we're discouraged, we need to find that will to dig in, to engage, and to do good. My community has greatly shaped my perspective on how to create change in the world. 
I grew up on a small island off the coast of Maine in a community of just 350 year-round residents, a 12-mile ferry ride from the mainland. My graduating class from high school was just five people and they were all girls. So the women power has gone, gone on for a while. My, I watched my parents run small businesses, both become EMTs, serve as the tax assessor and school board member, help the town start the newspaper, the local economic development, and the community housing organization. And I still live in this island community today where my sister serves on the school board and runs the pizza restaurant and her partner runs the housing organization and works as an EMT. And my husband serves on the planning board and the community center board and takes the graduation pictures. And my dad helps build homes for our neighbors and my kids already pay attention to town meeting and who is in charge and why do people litter and what are we gonna do about climate change? And I'm not doing enough, according to my children. My mom still comes home to babysit her grandkids after engaging every day on how to confront our nation's biggest challenges. And my family isn't unique. We all dig in in my community because we need to. And without hundreds of other island people doing the same, our island community wouldn't work. In so many communities across our state, very small towns like mine and big cities like Portland, we recognize that change, the progress, the good things that will make a difference in the world will come from each one of us. No one else is going to fix the big and hard problems. It is only us. I've spent much of my life in public service holding true to these values, and I have the coolest job in the state of Maine, leading Governor Janet Mills' Office of the Future. And my faith in the future of our state is because I know that we can solve hard problems. Mainers are practical people. We're not always optimistic, but we are driven by common sense and we are problem solvers. And that's what I get to do in my job. With an incredible team, I get to bring people together across our state to implement the state's bold climate and energy goals. I get to support leaders working to improve the lives of Maine's children and to advance housing solutions. I get to engage with state policy makers and businesses and education institutions to support an innovative and robust economic future for our state with a diverse workforce. And on every issue, I get to see wonderful people, from youth climate leaders to early childhood educators to healthcare practitioners to committed town officials and small business owners to innovative housing developers, and they are each digging in to do the important work. And on every issue, I have learned that as we face problems that seem daunting, the best thing we can do is to put one foot in front of the other and keep pushing. We won't be able to fix all of everything, but we can have an impact. And the work may be as, may be as hard as it has ever been, as negativity, naysayers, NIMBYs, and others make problem solving difficult, but we can't give in. So what can you do? You can do what you can, and if we all do what we can, we will make a difference. You can serve on a community or nonprofit or volunteer board where you can dig in and provide positive support, as I think probably everybody in this room is now doing. Whether you're a fundraiser, an artist, or a cook, you are needed. You can run for the legislature or the city council or go higher. You can engage with the children who most need our support. You can employ a teen who's unlikely to get a summer job or internship or mentor them to understand the work, understand work and what you do. You can help a family seeking asylum feel welcome as they navigate uncertainty. You can do your part to reduce fossil fuel usage with a heat pump or weatherization or by walking or biking to work as we fight climate change. You can build an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, onto your house or above your garage to help a community member find housing. You can become a recovery coach to help those recovering from, addi from addiction. Or you can be a positive force for whatever good moves you in your business, your school, your community, and beyond. I've learned in my life on my small island that be and beyond that no one is coming to save us or fix our problems. We have to each dig in and do the work. We have to put in the time, we have to see beyond ourselves to care about each other. Writing our politicians and speaking out is good and it is important, but to really fix things, we need more. So we each have to do what we can and if we are lucky enough and able to do more, we must. That is how we will find faith and optimism in this seemingly troubled world and that is how the world will get better. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That, if I distilled everything you said into three words, I would say community, problem solving, and optimism.
and I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Um, I now call on Trustee Crystal Williams to present today's final Deborah Morton Award candidate. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the University of New England, it is my pleasure to present the 2022 Deborah Borton Society Award recipient, Julia Sleeper Whiting. Julia Sleeper Whiting is the co-founder and executive director of Tree Street Youth Center, a Lewiston-based nonprofit organization empowering young people and adults to co-create youth programs and partnerships that encourage leadership, learning, exploration, and growth. Born and raised in the Bangor area, Julia initially moved to Lewiston during her time as an undergraduate at Bates College. Her experience as a student introduced her to the downtown Lewiston community and its youth as she engaged in service learning opportunities afforded to her as a psychology and education major. Over the past 10 years, Julia has continued to build on the relationship she formed as an undergrad, seeking to provide valuable programming to at-risk youth in the Lewiston-Auburn area. After completing her master's degree in leadership and organizational studies at the University of Southern Maine, Lewiston Auburn, the Lewiston Auburn branch, she began the Tree Street Youth Center. This once grassroots organization has grown to become a hub for leadership exploration and growth built on the foundation of centering the voices of Lewiston's young people. At the same time, Julia has emerged as a thought leader across the state of Maine in the fields of education, juvenile justice, youth development, racial equity, academic success, and workforce development. Julia has done so much for the young people of Maine in her community, and it's our privilege to acknowledge her for this work today. Please, uh, please join me in honoring Julia Sleeper Whiting. All right, uh, well, I had to go last, so this is very, uh, this is such an impressive stage here and thank you all for making this possible and for all of you that are here um, and thank you also Peggy for the nomination um, and for all that sat on that committee this is really an honor and exciting it's also really hard to go last so we're gonna hang in there is my medallion straight Sam okay she's like scooted over all right um, so yes, I just again would like to begin by thanking for everyone that made this event possible. Um, it's really truly is an honor to be here and to share the stage again with just such inspiring people, just amazing women all over the place here and many who have been mentors to me over the years as I've, I've grown in my own leadership and, and in my own self-development. So uh, in preparation for this little speechlet, um, I was advised to think about what helped shape me into the person I am today and what inspires me to live each day with deep purpose and conviction uh, and to try to keep believing the world can be better um, and that it's worth trying to continue to improve things regardless uh, of how challenging things may feel, which as we know is pretty intense lately around the challenges that we're facing. Um, and that I was supposed to share all of that in about four minutes or under. So get ready, get ready. Um, uh, I was up for the challenge. And so with my third three minutes and about 30 seconds left, you all with me still? All right, let's go. So I realized I'm reflecting on this question that the answer really landed in, in something a little bit different. Um, it actually landed in trees. Um, being from Maine, trees are very, very special things. If anyone has ever visited Tree Street Youth, the organization that I founded, everything is tree related. We can take a tree metaphor for days, um, which really works well when you work with kids, especially it's just growth and leaves and branching. You, you can be following me. So trees have always been, uh, played a really important role in my life. and. 
I know that might sound a little bit funny, but I actually think you would all agree if you actually really stuck for a moment to think about um, the role trees play in our lives and in on our planet and in our world. Um, I did attempt at one point in time to be a bio major. Well, that got cut short because of Chemistry 107. Um, Paula Schlax at Bates College, thank you for steering me in the right direction. Um, however, uh, so I won't get too scientific here, but I'll stick to the simple uh, explanation of the reality is trees have leaves. Uh, leaves remove toxins uh, in the air uh, to produce clean air that then enables us all to breathe and live. Uh, living then allows us to fulfill our purposes in all that we do um, and all the things we're meant to do uh, during our time here on earth. Uh, so how I see it, trees are quite important to say the least, and without them our purposes would actually never be accomplished. Um, so now most people, uh, especially if you've lived in New England or in Maine for a while, uh, have seen what's called those little helicopter seeds. You guys know what I'm talking about. People have different names for them, but uh, these seeds are actually known as Samara seeds. That's the scientific name for them. Um, it, that was a term I did not know until more recently, but if you grew up in Maine again, as I did, um, it's almost guaranteed you've witnessed these unique seeds get sort of released from their home tree and flutter and spin until they landed somewhere on the ground below. Uh, if they were lucky enough to land in rich soil, they would actually begin to sprout into the ground and eventually over time they would grow into a new tree. Uh, I never knew why the symbolism of the Samara seed uh, was so significant to me, but I think it has something to do with so much potential existing in the midst of something so small, but it needing to fly a bit and reach its sort of perfect landing spot in order to fulfill its ultimate purpose. Um, it also couldn't become what it was destined to be until it hit that exact right spot. And so for me, the ground that I landed on that truly helped cultivate me into who I am today was Lewiston. Uh, in particular, the Tree Street neighborhood, which is the downtown neighborhood of where the center is located. This community was where I met people from all over the world for the first time and discovered that uh, the true vulnerability that comes along with truly loving with your whole heart. Uh, it's there that I was forced to grow, uh, see myself and my life experiences for all they were, and see the realities and impact education, exposure to difference, and inspiration can truly have on a person. I found purpose in encouraging others and wanting to ensure each and every human I connected with knew they were powerful beyond measure and had great purpose in the world. The youth I met inspired me. Their visions were vast and great and truly grounded in the belief that the world can be anything we choose it to be if we are able to be honest with ourselves about our needs as individuals and as a society. This is where I learned the hardest lesson to accept that all humans have the capability to hurt others, all humans, myself included, and we will but we also have the ability to heal these pains if we choose to as a community. My own growth and healing came from creating Tree Street Youth. For anyone who may not know, Tree Street is a Lewiston-based community of youth and adults who use their diverse lived experiences and collective empowerment to co-create youth-centered programs and partnerships that encourage leadership, learning, exploration, and growth. We are grounded in radical accessibility and relationships rooted in equity and care. Today we serve over 120 youth daily through the center and in a year anywhere between 750 to 1,000 different kids will access the center, speaking over 25 languages at last count. Our vision is to cultivate leaders who fear less, love more, dream bigger, to create communities united across all lines of difference. I am so proud of the incredible youth and teams of adults that 
who have gotten uh, Tree Street to the point where we just celebrated our 10th uh, year anniversary just this past summer and almost on to our 11th now. Uh, it was a very small, immediate vision that began very, very tiny, just like that Samara seed, and boy, has it grown. Uh, the visual metaphor of the Samara seed is perhaps the most, sim uh, the most powerful symbol I have right now of courage, faith, potential, and purpose um, that I really can name at this point in my life, which is why I wanted to share it all with you today. So I stand here to encourage everyone to gather all you can from the trees around you. Uh, those people, places, and environments that make you feel safe enough to dream a bit bigger, fear a bit less, and, and be encouraged. Please go out and plant more trees in the world, whatever shape, size, type, form, or way you feel called to do, and that will inspire others to love more, uh, live a bit freer, and ultimately find their own purpose and not be afraid to step into it. I really thank all of you out here and beyond who have helped cultivate me over the years uh, to this point of my life. It's really, it's been an incredible experience growing up here in Maine and all the way to this day and building this organization. Um, it's really an honor to be here today with all of you in, Thank you for giving me this moment of reflection also that oftentimes when you work with kids, you don't always get. So thank you. Julia, thank you so much for those remarks that, you know, Metaphorically, each one of our students is like an acorn that we are nurturing and trying to give them everything they need to thrive and become successful. And quite literally, you might be interested to know that UNE um, has the world's, literally the world's number one leading expert on restoring the American chestnut tree. And the American chestnut tree is uh, one in five trees on the eastern seaboard used to be an, uh, an American chestnut and then a blight wiped them all out and he's found a way to create a blight-resistant version, and he is literally the number one expert. So we're committed to restoring the chestnut trees across the eastern seaboard. So anyway, I just thought you might find that interesting. Um, thank you so much. So awardees, please accept my most sincere congratulations on your membership to the Deborah Morton Society. On behalf of the UNE Board of Trustees, the Deborah Morton Society Steering Committee, and the entire university, I'd like to welcome you to the UNE family. Today's ceremony has been, as it always is, an important reminder of the incredible talent and power embodied in Maine women. We're so lucky to have so many women like you working for the people of our state. Thank you for all that you do. And I hope that you will all stay with us for a luncheon, which will begin in the back of this room once the platform party leaves the stage. So thank you again for joining us in celebrating these three distinguished women and the legacy of Deborah Morton. Thank you.